In 10 years, we have seen e-mounted bikes develop massively. Today, they are far removed, both visually and technologically, from the bikes of only a decade ago. But how have we come so far in such a short space of time? Well, today, we're gonna to take you on a journey of the evolution of the e-mountain bike. As we carved our way into the 21st century, mountain bikes had seen decades of development. They were pretty advanced, fine-tuned, and certainly up for the task in hand. E-bikes, well, they've been around a while too, but were being used largely by commuters and often by the older lady or gentleman. But 2008-2009 is a turning point as two engineers at Bosch in Germany decide to make a prototype. The engineers at Bosch had found the electrical drives, the sensor technology, hardware and software from the automotive world and paired it with the lithium ion battery technology from cordless power tools. With their prototypes, all they had to do was convince their CEO, which they did. And yet, even though they had a great product, they were still outsiders. After all, Bosch wasn't a bicycle company. In the beginning, you know, we hadn't had any contact or uh, any, uh, any relation to the bicycle industry so um so our, the team went to uh, trade shows to the eurobike to conferences to to just get to know the the industry and one of the first who really was curious to work with us was cannondale actually and back then we we worked with cannondale and they they helped us to step into the bicycle frame design and and teach us uh, how to uh, how to build or an interface around the motor. That was very important because now you have this drive unit and now you need to attach it and now you have the wire harness, the connectors. So we launched in 2010 at the Eurobike with I think it was 10 customers. In 2010, Highbike created the EQX Duro. It had a 55 newton meter Bosch motor on it. Although by today's standards, a pitiful 288 watt hour battery. Nevertheless, it was a monumental moment in time, and yet few people could foresee the impact that e-mountain bikes were going to make. The initial e-mountain bikes did not use the latest and greatest technology you had already on the normal mountain bike, on downhill or enduro or on, on all mountain. Um, but this was only for two or three years. So when, when the high bike Exploro came to the market, it was an okay full suspension bike. Uh, and it has the design appeal and the optics, but not the rideability. So basically from, from the length of the bike, from the whole geometry setup, it was an okay, let's say touring mountain bike, but not a super sportive. This, this came later and this went very fast. So within, I would say two or three years, they adopted uh, modern uh, geometry and better equipment when it came to suspension, travel, and, and gearing and brakes. And this was when basically we started from our generation one to the generation two, when we learned, okay, now we have different segments, we still have urban city tracking, and now we see sport of mountain biking taking off with, uh, with more volume. This is when we developed our performance line, which was basically then really uh, the, the, the better building block for e-mountain bikes. I think that Bosch did release like a proper e-bike motor. So, you know, a lot of the thanks for the whole, you know, kickstarting the industry goes to Bosch, no question about it. Um, but I think what High Bike did that was different was that they, they rotated the motor. So they put it so it wasn't, wasn't going to get contact with the ground. They put a skid plate on it. They put it. I think inside of the frame um, and this just made the bike uh, much more capable off-road at that time yeah the bikes were just not designed to be ridden off-road they just had road version in so many minds it clicked where it's like hey this is actually this is fun everybody who has ridden an e-bike knows the sensation the first time you step on the paddle it's that woo and that smiley face and that excitement there is hardly any other product that I know of, just consumer goods, that creates so much excitement in the first two, three seconds. A few smart people realize that amongst us and say, this is, there is, there is something to it. And there is so much fun and excitement being created so quickly. 
uh, we have to look a little deeper into that and create a product that actually is fun. The scene was set with Europe seemingly to be the proving ground of the E mountain bike. But while the early off-road electronica had some great detail, they did leave a lot to be desired visually and still carried an image of old people's shopping bikes surrounding them. The first proper e-bike was a sample bike from Bosch. They came over, flew to Morgan Hill. It was 2009. Interestingly, they couldn't fly with a battery, so they actually brought it without and then went buying uh, a lawnmower battery in the, uh, in the hardware shop. <laughs> and uh, hacked this one back to their motor and it was a Bosch lawnmower uh, battery. <laughs> so that, that, that was the first proper e-bike uh, in terms of torque sense and cadence sense and what we understand in terms of uh, modern motor. Everybody hated e-bikes. It was uh, bikes made for our grandparents. Uh, Mike was, Mike the owner, Mike Sinyard, uh, was like, we're never gonna do an e-bike. Uh, we're a performance company, we're driven by performance, we win the Tour de France, we win the Cross Country World Championship, uh, we might invest in downhill racing, but we're not investing a single dollar in e-bike. Um, the, that was fun. Um, the, there was a couple of people that saw the motivation and saw that this could go somewhere. And uh, I was lucky to be part of that small team. And we just uh, hacked together um, a bunch of parts and actually built one as a side project. The displays were rudimentary, the fittings and wiring not harnessed in the ways we take for granted today. And well, they were certainly not ready for big mountain adventures with batteries not that much larger than a cordless drill. Bosch was just looking at partners. At that point, we didn't even have a, uh, a project. Like at that point, we were totally against e-bikes. Like we're not an e-bike company. <laughs> it's... <laughs> Um, the, the first e-bike we did was in 2012, was the launch date. And we started in 2010, that was the Turbo S called, and had a big fat rehab motor from Switzerland. So we, we actually decided against Bosch in the early days. We wanted us to be possible to manipulate the whole system as we want, and not just take this one and put it in and give it a different color. Now, mountain bikes in the same 2010 era have become pretty sophisticated by this point. A story of 30 years development, one which begins, so the legend has it, on the outskirts of San Francisco. And yet, whilst we know that bicycles have been ridden off-road since the 19th century, and e-bikes have been around for a long time as well, trying to trace the origins of the first e-mountain bike are actually quite difficult. I would say the Levo is the first modern um, e-mountain bike, but the first the first e-bike with knobby tires was certainly for me the high bike. That was not built back in the days for the people that already rode really technical terrain on 160 millimeter enduro bikes, because then this bike would have looked different. Like we were just chatting and a friend of mine came called Alex Tuspas. He was the guy who basically set up high bike at the beginning. Anyway, he came and sat down at this table with Dave Weigel and this other BMX guy. And, and I was like, oh, this is Alex. He invented the e-mountain bike. He's like, huh, did he? <laughs> I was there. He's like, I had one, the, 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 the Japanese, they sent me this electric motor in this ridiculously bad bicycle back in the like 90s or even like like eight like crazy crazy long ago and i think lapierre also somehow claimed to make the first one you can probably find it on wikipedia like going back i think it goes back almost like 80 years you know till the, probably close to the invention of the electric motor and the, um the battery they made like very early electric powered bicycles but yeah. really mass market capable e-mountain bikes i think high bike were the first to do it. The time was right because already in the 2000s, like 2005 to 9, there were some initial steps into mountain biking, like KDM built a bike with a rear hub motor. Uh, I think Flyer already built a, a, a kind of mountain bike or <laughs> with, with a Panasonic <laughs> system. These were the first let's say tryouts and uh, when we brought our system already in 2010 at Eurobike, uh, high bike and Rotwild actually um, they, they they built hardtail mountain bikes with our generation one system that was that was very very interesting they came more from trekking bikes to hardtail mountain bikes but already in 2010 11 you could see what is possible if you have a more sport of system back then they had rear hub 
or they had Panasonic and they were both not suited well for mountain biking. We brought the, the building blocks and the, and the system to the market and the bicycle manufacturers, they designed the, the sportive and more dynamic frame and system around it. I would say that high bike in 2010 is more to me an SUV bike these days. A trekking yeah. bike with knobby tires. Having that said, nobody had the balls to do it what they've done. And they've started something that they, they've kicked up that wave that we are surfing today. So like I'm lifting my hat, I'm a uh, high five to high bike. They've done something that we didn't do. Um, so I would yeah. say uh, give give high bike the first uh, electrified uh, knobby tire bike and we do we have the first real modern uh, approach. Remember Swiss brand Flyer also had a full suspension e-bike with a 350 watt Panasonic motor in 2010 as well. But hey, Californians, Europeans, whatever. It's what happened next which is really important as a whole industry went after something which has totally transformed just what you can do on a mountain bike. And Bosch were pioneers of that push. What we brought to the market is uh, an I would say a new way of bringing together a high performing system solution where all the components play perfectly together and they are perfectly synchronized. So the drive unit, the battery, the display HMI control unit, the charger, this is a system. And that includes also what we call the diagnostic system. And I think this whole package changed the game because we brought an um, a modular building block where all the interfaces are standardized and the bike manufacturer could choose different drive units, different batteries and different display uh, products and combine them to a new system that he would use for a different bike type. And, and with that, we, we gave them basically more solutions to build bikes around. And uh, I think this is also why more and more uh, OE manufacturers came to work with us because they saw the potential for them to electrify more bikes faster uh, because the, the, the system integration into a bike, this is for them, this is a, a tremendous engineering work and also later downstreams in their supply chain and manufacturing if then more and more of these uh, production steps are, um, are standardized, uh, including the, the software and the electronics. It's just faster for them to, to scale. I think this was uh, the, the main main contributor that we helped the industry to scale. As I, as I said earlier, it's, we had a fight for actually having the, the green light to work on e-bikes in general. But the first product, Turbo S, was an urban bike and there is at Specialized in the urban category, it's way easier to do some experiments than in the mountain bike category. Mountain bike category, uh, we, there, we stand for certain things, we are extremely successful, don't screw up. <laughs> the next 10 years sees a significant improvement on the technological front and a massive shift in people's perception of e-bikes. However, for many, the mechanics evolve faster than the mindset. These then were the pre-electric days at Morgan Hill, California, but a scene was very much sown and soon after the beginnings of Levo were well underway and it seemed the path would very much have to be their own one and on their own terms. We, we wanted to get the battery internally. That, that was, I think, the number one reason why we wouldn't want to buy a system. The battery had to be inside the tube. That was, that was it. That, that was a decision. We stayed true to it. But to do that, you need an engine, and we didn't have one. So around 2010, that Brosy engine came around, and we uh, we bought a couple of competitors' bikes. We bought like a high bike. We bought a Focus. Those were pretty much the only ones out there, I think, at that time. What else did we buy? And then we went to Utliberg, our famous mountain, and, and shredded those bikes and hit some jumps and tables and all kinds of fun stuff on, on all those various kinds of e-bikes and based off that we wrote our brief our charter for the for the levo rosie came by with a prototype they came by to ham they had a hardtail uh it was rideable we took it out for a spin around the neighborhood and i think it broke within five minutes got a test bike did a pedal stroke and i was like woohoo and then the pe <laughs> the motor just stopped and i was like oh I was like, what the hell why is this thing so slow like 
this is ridiculous. Like, it doesn't make sense because it was on, you know, in Eurobike, it's this flat car park, basically, or, or Mesa Halle. And I didn't really get, because there was no uphill. So on the flat, you hit the speed limit so fast. And if you're used to riding a normal bike, you just keep going and going and going up to, I guess, 30, 35. And I hit 25 and it felt like the brakes came on on that first motor. And yeah. I was like, okay, this is not for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was definitely, there was the core group, right, of the mountain bikes that were, we were all naysayers, I got to admit. Right? We were, we thought it was a, a very Euro thing that it was going to stay that way. And, you know, we had all the same feelings that the mountain bike group had up until maybe even just recently of it being more of a cheater bike and something that the elderly or that were somehow injured would ride relative to a, a real mountain biker. So there was definitely a group of us that were still on the, it's not for us. You know, it's not a product that, that we are interested in as a pure mountain bike. 2011 is also the year that Manu Antonot and Greg Sand start an e-bike business out of a small apartment, later to become moustache bikes. And in the following year, 2012, new motors are being revealed by Yamaha and Panasonic at Eurobike. And this was when basically we started from our generation one to the generation two, when we learned, okay, now we have different segments, we still have urban city tracking, and now we see sport of mountain biking taking off with, a, with more volume. This is when we developed our performance line, which was basically then really uh, the, the, the better building block for e-mountain bikes. It seems Bosch are now moving very swiftly through some not so heavy traffic, it seems. And with people already well behind them, a monumental game of catch up ensues. To give credit to Bosch, they definitely were, they pioneered the the e-bike systems um they were definitely the first for that but i yeah. think they were quite expensive at the beginning so it was very um niche and high yeah. bike they were looking for an alternative supplier as well because you know it's also they wanted to differentiate and so i think quite early on they got in touch with yamaha who were also developing a new system and um yeah their pricing was, was way more competitive than bosch and the motor was more powerful i think when they allowed high bike to create another segment instead of just a pure premium emtb segment they could have a more entry level uh, emtb segment all around the world in the headquarters of some of the big brands the movers and shakers the designers and product managers are beginning to put lots of their energy into this new sport the strategies are mixed and this revolves around closed and open motor systems with closed systems such as bosch the brands cannot modify whilst an open system such as tq allows for freedom to customize we identified early it's the easiest to create that identity if we actually do that whole recipe on our own we own the components, we dictate how they are supposed to work together. And then we don't have to knock on somebody's door. Can you adjust this? Can you adjust this? Can you adjust this? Plus if, if because there's 87 different brands knocking on their door. So, and in the end, they cannot fulfill everybody's needs. There is a compromise and we're not satisfied with that compromise. We want to do it exactly the way we want this thing to behave. So it's, it's the more painful way you need to invest in people. In Switzerland, we have right now uh, between 30 and 40 engineers and developers, plus all the global support. Um, it's an expensive way of doing it. And I realize it's not uh, something small brands can do, but it's the benefit of our situation right now. And it's paying out. I mean, As soon as I started riding these e-bikes, I was like, why does every single high bike say Bosch or Yamaha on it when you turn it on? Why have they got Bosch motors? Why is everything Bosch and Yamaha? Like, oh, what, what are you really doing? You're just basically whacking another, uh, like a, like a e-bike e system into a frame and then you're buying wheels from the same supplier, suspension from the same suppliers. Like, what is then a high bike? Is it simply just a frame and a graphics and a, a brand? Like, what does it really mean? Like, the only way you can actually fully take control of the development of the product and create a true high bike is if you have control of the motor and the shifter and the digital ecosystem that's around it. And I remember having this conversation with them and at the time they said I was crazy. I didn't know what I was talking about because it was really risky because if you 
yeah, if, if one thing goes wrong with a the motor, then the, it can kill a company. You know, like if, if you have a recall on, you know, 50,000 products, you're in big, big trouble. Like, so it's much easier just to take a system where you already have like a guarantee from the supplier. If something goes wrong, like Bosch will sort it out or Yamaha will sort it out. If you make your own system, that it's harder to have that guarantee. At least if you create it from scratch. I was pushing for the battery to go to the bottom, the exit to the bottom, because that was the only way I personally saw it to be possible to do with a, with a shock and a water bottle. And, and many of the engineers said that will never, ever happen for many different reasons. They had all kinds of reasons in the world for that being a very bad idea. It turned out not being the greatest idea, to be honest, because the, from a frame, it's difficult to make. It's difficult to cut half of the down tube away. And it's difficult to engineer a battery which uh, can sustain rock strikes and all kinds of hazard going that way. That, that was basically the main worry the guys had. At that time, what we did, though, is so for the charter, I remember really well what was important to us, the noise level and the, the battery being really, really well fixed in the frame. On the very first test rides, we basically a lot of batteries ejected all directions of that, like in that or very first beginning of mountain bike riding, when you would hit a big jump, you land and the battery would just boom, bounce out or have issues with the connectors, all kinds of stuff. So we said, let's bolt it on through axle, right? And we, and we still have a bolt down battery solution. We basically just said, we don't want a lock mechanism. We don't want the rattle noise, that this noise, you know, you hear on most bikes still today with, with using, using a lock. We said, no, no way. So we, decided on that through axle design very early in the project and everybody agreed, that's it, that's how we do it. We are able to differentiate, that we're able to make our geometries we like, that we're able to build a frame around something we believe in. And and all those parts together, it's, we could have made a Bosch bike if they would have said, hey, look guys, here's the engine, buy the engine, we help you customize the battery, we help you customize the, uh, the display, and on top of that, we help you build a, an app, a mission control app. That was, by the way, Jan T, Jan Talavasic. He was the main believer in the app. He was like above and beyond believing that a bike should be connected with an app. And he did the very first app, the, the, the true app, the, the first one we launched the bike with. It's, it was almost just him and, and the outside firm, these two guys uh, do, doing that app integration on their own, huh? without any support from nobody. An app for a mountain bike. I mean, can you imagine the faces of the purists? We knew that we're going to piss off some people. Um, back when we did this, there was the motivation to who can build the larger display. Uh, Bosch uh, was uh, in process of launching the Nyon, which is a fantastic navigation display for certain customers. But we wanted we wanted to focus on the true mountain bike rider, and we just like let's give a shit about what others are doing. Let's just focus on what we think the e-bike for us, and I mean for the, the, the 10 of us who actually worked on that project <laughs> should be. And the budget was really small. Compared to what we spent today, it was a tiny amount. Um, we were lucky enough to find a partner who was motivated to do the app for really cheap. And uh, as often as consultants think, they go in cheap and then hope to make the money further down the road. Uh, so the first app was really, it was, Compared to what we pay in other projects, it was very, very, very little money. But it was a lot of work. This is very much the beauty of like taking control of you know the entire system yourself. Like you can work to your own timeline a little bit. But the manufacturers they do deliver like you CAD data of the models of, of the motors pretty early, so you do have like all the the data to to work on it. But you know they're delivering the same package of of data to every manufacturer who's using their system. So everybody's kind of working the same timeline, the same speed, and we'll bring out bikes around the same time. In 2012, the TQ HPR 120S motor becomes available, but it's really under the radar. At 120 newton meters, it remains one of the most powerful on the market. And even though it is used on the M1 Sport Spitzing bike soon after, it's on the high bike fly on six years later that it really turns people's heads again. Still, displays, controls, battery management and motor software remains the next frontier. By 2013, we see a second generation Bosch motor, this time with 300 and 400 watt hour batteries. They have an onboard computer too. 
Latvia have this fitted and brands such as Cube and Kreidler have bikes close to market. We did not foresee what would happen in the next three, four years that went so fast, which is why we had the small sprocket, why we used a lot of, uh, let's say, frame space, uh, which would create longer chain stays. And we just underestimated how fast this development would, would go. In 2013, Specialized are busy constructing the first prototype of the Levo, and they actually make it in hardtail form. Shortly after, they make a printed version of the full suspension bike, but it's still a million miles from reality of production. The very first prototype we built was a hardtail, and I found a picture of it. It was a hardtail we utilized or took the Turbo S battery and and basically put a put a hardtail together and and then very soon we we realized that with the weight we need a full suspension to, to try proper then we made the first full suspension prototype that's the one you saw in ham <laughs> holger did the frame uh jan and myself selected the the components and the vendors and and basically we 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 made this very first prototype had it shipped to ham and did the first test riding in Ham. So we had that very first prototype, that red mule, and we took that bike, put it into uh, a bag, and flew with it to America, to one of those bigger meetings we have at Specialized at the headquarter. And basically, at that meeting, we killed many different projects for, for this one to stay alive and being full focus on that Levo. So we basically killed a, a, a bike we had in mind to fully focus on the Levo. And a lot of people were really upset about that because they were very far down with the project. And then we basically, Eric Getchcom at that time asked Jan and myself, so can you guys do both projects? And we were like, not really. If you want to really have one earlier, we need to focus on that one. And so that's how it all began. You could argue the seeds of change are only just beginning to take root in mountain biking. And e-bikes are at the very heart of this revolution, which doesn't really get rolling for a few years to come. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time and I'm always amazed how challenging and interesting this job can be because there's always something that seems to come along every 10 years or so that challenges the industry, whether it's wheel size or suspension, geometry, and now it's e-bikes. And it's how the industry's responded as well as like how the suppliers have responded has been super interesting. 2014 is a watershed and it's the year that many e-mountain bike brands begin rolling out the goodies for the journalists to argue over. Yeah, I would say that it, it would be the stereo. It was the first full suspension bike that I was would ride for a whole season. Yeah, that yeah. changed also my impression of what you can do. This was basically when we started with the uphill flow idea, uh, riding uphill technically and downhill. This was basically in that time, 2014. The Bosch Performance Line motor is now third generation with 60 newton meters and is seen on many bikes, including the high bike downhill, the first of its kind, and the newly launched S Duro range, onto which a 70 newton meter Yamaha motor is fitted. Trek have the Powerfly and Cube the stereo, which is grabbing many journalists' attention. I actually don't know how some companies were able to even survive that. Um, kind of revolution, evolution that Bosch went through because they changed almost every year for three years. And, you know, that that alone was a huge lift to just make the frames compatible with the new motors and batteries. And we're still struggling with it today with the changes because it's such a fast moving market. Um, I would say that those changes probably caused the most time and resources in our development group of anything else we've done meaning that we had more engineering time and industrial design in adapting to the changes that Bosch made than we had in figuring out the new box fork or the new debonair rear shock or any of the other things that we would do with a slash or a session or an EX. Um, so those, and those resource struggles continue. Uh, it's a big lift to get everything working now with electronics too. So when you've had that, we have now electronics engineers that are involved with trying to help with all the cable management and the integration, the HMI and all that stuff. So 
it's a big lift. It's a challenging business to be in uh, with e-bikes because of the chassis and then the motor battery integration. But we're still dealing with leads and cables, waterproofing and durability issues with frames. And batteries are still relatively low capacity. And meanwhile, out in the Far East, some of the employees of the mighty Shimano Corporation are beginning to feel a little bit left out and start working on an e-bike motor. Uh, actually, we started this uh, development from 2014 with our good team. And uh, uh, at that time, um, we don't know the e-mountain bike was coming or growing. We don't know. Everything. You didn't know? No, but uh, we found this kind of uh, riding is so fun, and uh, we should go this way to the uh, head uh, head office. <laughs> so, so um, and, uh, we uh, try to test and uh, uh, propose uh, making prototype or testing testing in the uh, United States also uh, Europe. Right. So, you, so you turned that around pretty quickly, four years, and you, well, three years, right? And you got... Three, yes, three years, yes. So with Shimano very much now in the mix, Gary Fisher, one of the pioneers of mountain biking, pronounces that e-mountain bikes will be the next great thing. And whilst e-bikes are still taboo in most parts of North America, Trek have a fact on the ground in the Powerfly. I would say the resentment to e-bikes was pretty strong in the US, maybe stronger than even anywhere outside the US uh, because of the way the trail organizations were set up in the US and how those trail organizations seem to have a pretty big anti-e-bike embedded into their, um, you know, their committees or their groups, right? So we had a, first of all, there's two factors. There's that part of it, the trail access part, but then there was also just regulation. So we had a government is set up in the United States. There basically were 50 set of rules in the 50 states of how e-bikes were being looked at. And so there was this big lift that was needed in the legal sense to figure out a way to just categorize these bikes so that they weren't lumped in with motorcycles or they weren't lumped in with ATVs. But where are the Californians? For a state that is said to be the birthplace of mountain biking, they are nowhere to be seen and have produced nothing of significance. In fact, many of them seem to have moved to Switzerland. We leave the story then with the Californians seemingly a long way behind. In the next instalment, we take the development of the e-mountain bike to the present day, as the sport gathers huge momentum with some incredible innovations.